Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining me on the Slice of Healthcare podcast. I'm your host, Jared Taylor. Joining me today is the co-founder and managing partner of MBX Capital, Gurdane Bhutani. How are you today? Doing great, Jared. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited to, to have you on and it's, it's always great we can bring an investor on that uh, really has a good outlook and, and view on the space. Um, and today you're going to give us a, an overview of MBX Capital, your background, and then some of your recent investments. So we're really excited to dive into those. We could start out by hearing about your background. I know the audience would love that. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, so thanks again, Jared, for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, in terms of my background, so I'm based in New York, uh, born here, but grew up in India and, and throughout the States. Um, I, I started my career uh, at undergrad, actually, as a, as a musician. So I uh, had the, the pleasure of starting a record label and, and pursuing that full time, gave it a good good shot, but uh, quickly realized uh, that uh, but, you know my, my future lay elsewhere. Uh, so joined Bain and Company uh, in New York, where I mostly worked in private equity and strategy uh, projects for the firm, uh, and then eventually left to start my first business uh, with my partner at MBX, which was called FundRx. Uh, FundRx was a healthcare and life sciences investment marketplace. We backed over 20 companies uh, in a marketplace investing model, and that's where my partner and I really cut our teeth uh, in the venture space. In 2020, we decided to launch MBX Capital, uh, which is an early stage venture capital firm uh, really focused on public health innovation. So we invest across healthcare services and technology through to biotech, med devices, diagnostics and tools. Uh, but really the core focus across the portfolio is can this company make a population level health impact? And that's what we're really seeking out when we partner with companies. And you, you said FundRx is still, is still running today, correct? Two separate funds? Uh, no, so FunderX is, uh, we, we wound down the marketplace business of FunderX. MBX continues to manage uh, all the FunderX investments, uh, but our focus today is is at MBX where we're, where we're deploying uh, new capital now out of our second fund. So let's talk about some of where you want to allocate, um, you know, the, the, the fund uh, dollars to. W- what really excites you? Like what spaces, what area of those spaces are you are you looking into? Yeah, absolutely. So within this broad theme of public health, there's a few areas right now that are really exciting to us. And, and we update these you know, throughout the year, but we're a pretty research-driven firm and try to invest around investment themes. Um, so, so right now within healthcare, uh, you know, we have this broad theme of over-medicalization. So the idea here is that you know, throughout the US in particular, we actually over-utilize medical care. And, and frankly, by the time we've, you know, many patients get into the medical system, uh, you know, their, their long-term health outlook, you know, can change to some extent, but it's not necessarily the point in time where you can make a massive change in the trajectory of their life. And so we're really trying to think about solutions that get people out of the the healthcare system and towards solutions that can, you know, long-term improve their health and and help them avoid uh, uh, medicine that they don't potentially need. And then ensuring that patients, when they do need to access healthcare, can do that in a really high quality way, right? Because we have all of this demand pressure on the system because we're not dealing enough with things upstream. So that's sort of one broad theme that we have. A second area that's exciting for us is, is healthcare infrastructure. Um, you know, I think everyone knows we have a massive staffing crisis in the United States. Um, we have an undersupply of, of clinicians across the board, whether those are you know primary care providers or nurses and so on. And I think the challenge there is that you know we're seeing uh, you know the, the quality of work experience that many healthcare providers have today frankly, isn't that great, right? There's a lot of administrative overload. There's a lot of bureaucracy. They don't get to spend that much time with patients. And so we're really excited about companies that can either A, increase the total amount of clinical capacity that exists by training and upskilling new workers. And then secondly, with our existing clinical workforce, you know, how can we make their experience at work, you know, much higher quality uh, and make them more excited to, 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 to be a provider and get them focusing on the stuff that's at the, the top of their license versus, you know, the administrative labor that only grows day by day. Um, so I'd say those are two areas within, within healthcare broadly that we're excited about. On the bio side, you know, I'll just briefly touch on one theme, which is really this, this broad area of the exposome. Um, so I think everyone knows over the last 30 years, um, the insights that have come from understanding our genomes have really enabled us to invent uh, and discover new medicines that have made profound impacts on human lives. Um, but the reality is that most disease today is actually environmental in its pathogenesis. So it comes from the environmental exposures that we have versus our genetic predispositions. And we don't have great tools for understanding our exposomes. And so we're really excited to invest and partner with companies that are that are focused on on creating the infrastructure that will enable to, enable us to sequence our exposomes, understand our environment more effectively, and it, as a result, make us healthier. 
And and you had three recent investments you wanted to dive into a little bit here today too. So, um, you know, and, and some of these are, are most of these are hitting on those themes that you just talked about. That's uh, right. I think it was Irene. Is it is it Eva or Eva? Eva. Yep. Um, and and Offor Health. Uh, yeah, talk us absolutely. through what each of those uh, do, Gurdain, and then why why MBX Capital invested in them. If you don't yeah, mind. Absolutely. So you know, despite the tumult that happened in the venture ecosystem in 2022, we were uh, fortunate to be in a place where we were very much uh, you know making new investments and deploying, and we continue to be. Um, so I'll I'll first speak about a, a company that we most recently invested in called Arene. Uh, which is based in the Bay Area and, and really hits on that that core thesis I mentioned just now of over medicalization. So, uh, Arene is really focused on this this challenge that we have in our in our uh, you know medical complex here, where we have huge polypharmacy challenges in uh, you know across the population. So you have patients on 14, 15 different medicines, and the reality is because of the burden that's placed on, placed on providers to do all of this other stuff, they, they don't really have the bandwidth to communicate necessarily with one another, and so you might get three or four medicines prescribed to you by one doctor, three or four prescribed by another doctor. Those medicines may have interactions. In fact, you know, those interactions may be making you sicker or, or damage your quality, life, quality of life in some way. And there's really no person in the ecosystem today that can sit down and look at your entire you know, uh, 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 pharmacopoeia that you're, you're taking and say, hey, like, here's how we can adjust and titrate and manage your medicines in order to make you healthier. There's some really excellent work that's been done around drug discontinuation in particular, where, you know, in a variety of papers, authors have shown that you can take a patient from, you know, that 14 or 15 medicines down to seven or eight and actually improve their quality of life and their overall health. And so Irene does this algorithmically by partnering with health plans and health systems in order to identify patients that are at risk of challenges like these. And they leverage a virtual pharmacy solution, which is really a software solution to help identify these risk factors, communicate those out to the providers and to the patients so everyone's on the same team, and get patients on the right amount of medicines at the right time. Um, and, and so we're really excited about the promise that they have with their, their platform. They've had really excellent growth for the last few years, and we're excited to partner with them. And how, how did some of these... Like, where was the initial, was there initial connection? What really led you to, to look into some of these companies? Now, I know it's a mix, right, in venture, right? Yeah. Sometimes you happen, which it definitely helps in the due diligence process, right? When you already know a founder, you've backed them before, which we see. Um, but there's also, you know, the companies that either reach out or you hear from someone else. Yeah. How do how do some of these deals work out? I know it's probably a mixture of in the network, someone uh, applied, yeah. right? But but what does that look like? So, you know, this is a, a theme, sort of this drug discontinuation theme within over-medicalization that we've been working on for over two years. Uh, we explored incubating a company in the space and met with a number of, you know, companies in space over the years and, and really has been a, 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 an area of core focus for us. Um, we're fortunate to know uh, uh, the team members at one of their customers and uh, in conversation with them, uh, you know, realize that, you know, they're providing a really valuable solution. And so in this case, we were introduced by a, a customer uh, of the company, uh, which is, you know, great validation for what they're doing. Perfect. That's even better. Um, yeah. Whenever you can hear from someone that's, that's, you know, paying and actively using the product uh, or Absolutely. service. Absolutely. Um, and, and then as far as these, these other investments in the space, what was the like core area of interest that that led you wanting to? Yeah, absolutely. Invest? So I'll, I'll hit on the other two, uh, you know, briefly as well. We're, we're also very excited about them. So, um, Eva Technologies is a is a company based in Mexico City. Uh, you know, focus on improving radiology infrastructure throughout Latin America. Um, you know, it, it's a a region where you know you have a huge amount of growth, uh, a huge amount of opportunity. But in, in many ways, the the healthcare technologies that we use in the U.S. Uh, and in Europe are not well suited to an emerging market. Um, and you, you see this, you know, across the board, you know, but, but in particular in radiology. Um, and so what, what Eva has built initially is a PACS and LIMS system uh, for radiology practices to use. It's cloud-based, uh, you know, really easy to use, has the right pricing model for providers in the region. And as a result of that is enabling providers to leverage technology that frankly wouldn't otherwise be affordable in the regions that they operate. This improves quality of care, uh, and, and dramatically increases, you know, clinical capacity in the region. Really phenomenal uh, group of founders at that company, and, and, and excited to back them. So that's really aligning with our infrastructure thesis. And then Offor Health uh, is based in Columbus, uh, uh, Ohio, 
um, you know, the team there, you know, similarly is really thinking about, you know, how can we enable patients to get really high quality care, you know, in the, in the right setting without sort of undue delay. And the initial area they've, they've, they've focused on has been the pediatric dentistry, uh, 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 you know, sort of focus. Uh, it's a really in interesting space because, you know, as you probably know, many, uh, you know, the, the majority of children in the U.S., you know, are, are covered by Medicaid. Um, and when they have complex uh, dental surgeries that need to happen, you, you can have kids waiting, you know, four or five, six, almost up to nine months in some cases to get time in the OR because those cases generally don't reimburse very highly for health systems. And so that can be a real challenge to accessing care that actually is very much necessary for these patients. And so the model that they've pioneered at all for has basically been to shift these surgical interventions for pediatric dental procedures out of a hospital OR where appropriate and into the dentist's office. And so they built a logistics infrastructure that enables an anesthesiologist, a PACU nurse, an EMT to show up and turn a dental office into a, you know, basically a, a surgical site where you can do full anesthesia. And that is cutting wait times down for these kids from up to nine months down to two weeks and improving sort of the provider experience across the board as well, because you don't have to travel to the OR and so forth. Um, and so again, fits within our sort of thesis of building clinical capacity and building clinical infrastructure. Um, in the case of all four, we, we were introduced to them by one of the providers that works for them. So again, great signal, uh, 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 you know, that what they're doing is, is working. And in the case of Eva, that was one where we had built a thesis within uh, Latin America and it, it got to know the founder directly. That's true. It, it's always great when you can hear from one of those key stakeholders, right? Whether it's the, the clinician or uh, an, an active customer or a partner. So that's great. Absolutely. What, what areas do you tend to focus in on then geographically? Because, you know, I'm hearing a couple of different areas. Um, wh what is that list of kind of areas that definitely pique your interest that you would consider making investments uh, in companies in those, you know, countries yeah. or surrounding areas? So, you know, I'd say 80 to 90 percent of what we do is is focused on the U.S. and and, and occasionally Canada as well, um, particularly on the medical device side. Um, however, the sort of the two uh, global markets that we're most excited about are, are Latin America broadly. I mean, it's a, it's a huge region, right? For us, we're initially focusing in, in Mexico and sort of their ability to serve companies primarily in Central America. Um, and, and then the other market that's very exciting to us is, is South Asia, specifically India. Um, you know, where we've made an investment, uh, you know, as, as well. And so we anticipate, you know, that percentage will uh, shift slightly, uh, where we'll be making more investments in those regions. But, you know, geographically, those are those are the three areas of focus for us. And, you know, uh, we, we hear a lot about the investing landscape and the healthcare landscape in 2023 and beyond. Yep. Can you can you give us your outlook on on how you think things are going to go in 2023? And then, you know, I, we, we realize this is just your opinion on the matter, but I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on from an investing perspective and then also how these companies in healthcare will continue to grow. What what could that look like? Yeah. So, you know, I think just in terms of the macro, I think 2023 is going to be a tough year. I think in some ways it might actually be tougher than 2022 for, you know, the entire startup ecosystem. And, and, and the reason for that is that, you know, there's a there's a time lag between, you know, when the public markets internalize rate changes and what's going on in the macro economy. Uh, to, to the private market, particularly at the early stages where we're focused. And so we're starting to see that sort of adjustment happen. You know, I think, frankly, you know, it's, it is, you know, there's certainly a, uh, you know, an important human layer to this, right? There will be layoffs, there will be, you know, very painful times ahead, you know, on a very, uh, on a very human level, um, you know, and that's going to be really difficult. Um, on the other hand, I, I do think that this correction is important and necessary. Um, you know, I think there's been, um, you know, a, a exuberant funding environment um, that VCs are guilty of, of, of fomenting uh, and, 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 you know, the ecosystem broadly is, is guilty of, of partaking in over the last decade or so within, you know, health tech. And I think this correction is good because it, it gives us the ability to really look back and say, look, these are the business models that are sustainable, that work, that make systemic change and really drive value in the healthcare system. And these are the business models that, frankly, don't have unit economics that are rational and aren't sustainable and have been propped up by venture dollars and, you know, probably shouldn't be a part of our healthcare ecosystem going forward. And so I think it's, you know, long term positive for the ecosystem what we're going through right now, despite it being, you know, a painful moment. I think in terms of areas of innovation, you know, I think as we come out of this first 
you know, or second boom, if you will, of, you know, telehealth that's really been buoyed by the pandemic. I, I think there's a recognition that, you know, just putting a doctor on Zoom is not enough to really drive change. Yes, you're to some extent improving access, but you know, there's so much more that we can do there, right? There's a way to create a more intimate relationship with a patient, a more longitudinal relationship with a patient, you know, through virtual visits. And historically, it's really been sort of a one-off interaction. You're doing some triaging. I, I think there's a way to really shift that and become digital first, integrate an important face-to-face -face layer when necessary, and as a result, improve quality and, 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 and drive access. Um, so I'm excited about that. I'm optimistic for for new care models that we'll continue to you know we'll continue to see and an innovation that we'll continue to see over the next uh, year and and thereafter. Um, and so uh, I, I'm I think net optimistic uh, for for where we'll be a few years from now when we look back on this moment. And last question for you: What's next for you and the firm that you're really excited about? Yeah. So for for us in the firm, you know we are we are laser focused on on public health innovation. Uh, you know, we've got a lot in the pipe around building community uh, around public health, uh, creating more of an entrepreneurial mindset within the public health ecosystem, which has usually been thought of as somewhat separate from, you know, uh, the traditional innovation ecosystem, right? It's sort of an academic and government exercise versus an area where private innovation can play. But we see a really important role for private innovation within public health and see it as being a, a real potential accelerant and value driver, uh, you know, for, for population level change. Uh, and, and so, you know, we'll, we'll have uh, some fun things to announce over, over the coming uh, quarters uh, on that front, um, but it, it'll be an exciting time for sure. Well, we look forward to following MBX Capital and, and staying in touch with you. Hopefully we can have you come back on again to tell us some of uh, your recent investments and how things, you know, it's always great to hear your pulse on the market. So how things are going. Uh, wish you Thanks all the so best. Much, yeah, thank I you. I really, really appreciate the time. 